Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you to the Canadian Open Data Summit for inviting me to this virtual session. My name is Marc-André Fauchet. I'm project manager at the Canada Center for Mapping Earth Observation within Natural Resources Canada. Uh, more specifically, I'm with the GeoBase division, which is tasked with the creation and maintenance of foundational geospatial data in Canada. My team's mandate is essentially as the operational arm of our R&D group, uh, but we'll get into that as the presentation goes along. So my presentation today is on how CCMEO is leveraging deep learning its mapping activities. But first, I want to give a bit of a historical context of mapping in Canada to highlight the fundamental shift in our approach for key activities of the branch. Don't worry, I won't be going too much into the details. Uh, but first, I think it's important to note that there have been long-standing public agencies who have been carrying out mapping activities, such as NRCAN, uh, which has been carrying out mapping activities for upwards of 100 years and it actually just took us over 100 years to complete base mapping for the whole country at the 1 to 50,000 scales. Um, these initial base maps were built and used for resources exploitation, national development, and large infrastructure planning. The needs eventually evolved towards land management, provision of services, uh, and where we started with paper map and analog approaches, we eventually evolved through the years with the advent of computers, the internet, satellite platforms, etc. Then the mid 2000s, there was the arrival of what we could qualify as major dis disruptors, and I don't necessarily mean that in a negative way, with the open street maps, the Google Maps, which have had the new value proposal based on services, and those were extremely uh, uh, enticing to, to users, as everyone here probably uses uh, some mapping services uh, on a daily basis. However, these newer initiatives get their data mainly through aggregation, meaning that they take what is openly accessible and integrated as part of their service or initiative. There are some fairly striking exceptions, however. Uh, if you think of roads where Google's and Apple's collect vast amount of data from phones and main to update and maintain their road network, but that's part of the value of open data it fosters innovation. Uh, finally, uh, just before moving on, all this mapping information, depending on where you look, is associated with varying level of data licensing. Uh, most cartographic information produced by public agencies will be distributed under an open government license when no privacy or security issues are present. So to recap, it took over 100 years for NRCAN to map Canada at the 1 to 50,000 scale. I'll note that the department underwent significant cuts in mapping capacity or some 15, 20 years ago, as new players were emerging and significantly changing the map mapping landscape worldwide. Uh, nevertheless, there is global recognition that data is a strategic asset required for land management, emergency management, environmental monitoring, and social economic activities. Uh, open geospatial data provides value to the Canadian population and industry, and as well with the ongoing rate of change to Canada's landscape brought on by climate change, urban development, and urban sprawl, we can't wait or function on a 100-year re revisit cycle to map uh, foundational features of our country and be expected to have the required data to take informed decision on things like climate change adaptation, environmental protection, hazard identification, resources development. To respond to this need, since the mid to late 2010s, NRCAN made several strategic investments to develop its automatic mapping activities with the use of artificial intelligence. This started to crystallize really in the um, around 2019 with the creation of our GOAI framework and the development of our IT infrastructure. It continued in the in, in early 2020 with the creation of our training and benchmarking data sets, which is still ongoing today. Then we started working on model development and testing. To this day, I believe we trained and tested upwards of 500 AI models and retained only a few ones which show a high degree of performance. Uh, last year, we implemented our machine learning operations system or MLOps and moved towards operational use of AI. And finally, this year, we can now say that GeoAI is operational within NRCAN. We use this capacity to deliver on core mandate for NRCAN from the creation and maintenance of foundational geospatial data, on-demand emergency mapping, and support other department activities. All of this in an agile, efficient, and cost-effective manner. To make it all work, there are a few key ingredients required. Some I've already mentioned to 
but uh, want to re-emphasize. Uh, expertise for data science and systems development technologies, including tools, namely uh, deep learning software, which we've developed and maintained uh, the geo deep learning tools, which are openly accessible through our GitHub page. I'll link to, to those resources at the end of the presentation. Platform for, for us, it includes our data cube to store and stream vast quantities of raster data. The architecture, we've opted for a microservices approach, which, which enables us to be flexible and agile in the development and processing of, of uh, data. Uh, the IT infrastructure, we make use of both the private sector through uh, Amazon Web Services or AWS and Canada's High Performance Computing Center for storing and processing a large volume of data. Finally, the, again, data, I've come back to it, uh, which I've already mentioned a few times, but AI is extremely data hungry. Uh, finally, engagement. We remain a fairly small team, but we have very big ambition, meaning that we have to establish collaboration and partnership based on win-win approaches. Most importantly, I'd say with our provincial and territorial counterparts, we also have access to a wealth of data, which we can use to train our model, process, and extract results as well. In a nutshell, our process for machine learning operation is to acquire data, develop the model, run the extractions, evaluate them, make correction and use the new features to add to the training data volume to improve the model's accuracy. Once we're satisfied with the model performance, we bring into production. Our approach to production is very similar to what I just described for the model training and evaluation. In fact, the two processes actually overlap quite a bit, but I wanted to make the distinction between the training activities and the data production once a model has been developed, evaluated and brought into production. Again, we start by acquiring data, mostly through our satellite imagery subscription service, but, uh, but as noted also by establishing collaboration and partnership with key actors. Then we upload the data to, to, to AWS to start the pre-processing to ensure ortho rectification is done, but also to bring into a standard format for the inference process. As part of this, we also inventory it using the spatial te temporal asset catalog or stack standard, which enables easy indexing and discovery. We then push the pre-processed image to our data cube platform. Then we start the inference process, which, which is done within, within the HPC environment. This is also include the process for polygonization and regular, regularization of the extractions. Finally, we move to the publication, which are done manually for visual inspection of the results, some correction of major issues, validation, or rather evaluation of the end product, and publication if the data is deemed to meet the minimum qualification for publication. On semi-regular intervals, we'll push our validated data sets to the Canada's open, government, uh, open data portals. Actually, we launched the GOAI GeoBase series in late October, which initially, uh, which had an initial sample of roughly 50,000 square kilometer. Shortly, we should also be releasing another 70 to 80,000 square kilometer, covering the whole of New Brunswick that was extracted uh, using uh, um, imagery provided by the government of New Brunswick. I'll note that since the initial release, we have already greatly improved our AI models and are seeing marked improvement in our outputs, which are in currently integrated in our, in our production run for the New Brunswick imagery. Uh, I have a few examples of the project just a little later on in this presentation. So at this point, you might be wondering, what is GOAI? Well, essentially, GOAI are automatically extracted features representing roads, surface hydrography, uh, buildings and forested areas, and they are extracted automatically with minimal attribution and correction. Uh, when we highlight them against other um, typical base mapping products, such as the National Topographic Database, um, we, we have uh, a lot less classes. We focus on what we deem the most important ones. Uh, but but on the other hand, we do it much faster. So the, the whole process for us takes uh, roughly four to five hours to, to, to extract and to, to pre-process, extract and inspect the, the results, whereas it was taking four to eight months for one NTS sheet uh, to, to be produced uh, using manual approaches for the NTEB. Uh, we also do it at a much finer scale uh, with uh, imagery typically ranging between 30 centimeters and 50 centimeters. <clears throat> 
So one other important distinction of this series is that multiple data extraction can exist simultaneously or the same geographic area at multiple points in time, thus time enabling the data series. We structure the data per project where a project corresponds to a source data set or a tile with specific information associated at the project level. This information namely includes time of acquisition and source type. Then we break the project down by subproject, with each one corresponding to a feature type. With that, we link information uh, of, on the extraction model. So some model will be specific for each class. Uh, hence, model can be, multiple models can be used uh, for the same project. Uh, as well, we list accuracy, um, such as emission, commission, delineation, when those are evaluated. Finally, we have our, our, our base level or our third, uh, third level, which is uh, at the entity level, uh, which are mostly geometries with light attribution, including length and area. So now I, I want to take a quick look at the data. So for the demo, I loaded a couple of projects extracted from aerial imagery over New Brunswick. Here I start by zooming in. And you'll see I'll focus on, on uh, hydrography. And I put the Google imagery in the background just because it's uh, fast to load. <coughs> so here you see some discrepancy between our extraction and, um, and the, the Google imagery. Uh, I'm loading in the uh, aerial image from New Brunswick just uh, to highlight that that was actually uh, just a change in, in condition for the, for the river. And now I continue browsing I'm just panning around, uh, looking at the data. I'm turning on and off the vegetation layer so that you can see what uh, what was extracted as part of vegetation. Uh, you'll notice a few issues. Uh, one of the most problematic um, uh, layer for us is uh, is roads. Oftentimes, we we um, our algorithm has issues tracking roads along certain segments. Um, here, I focus again on on hydrography. I'll load in the, uh, the, 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 the source imagery just to showcase that uh, the, the algorithm actually properly worked. Uh, the difference that we were seeing was just due to seasonality or, or changes in, the, um, in the, the river condition at the time of the acquisition. Now I'm looking at another area. Um, again, with the Google imagery in the background, um, looking at uh, some of the building footprints that were extracted. I do see a bit of a shift, so I'll load in the, the source image just to make sure that that wasn't an issue. Uh, and it's just caused uh, due to the difference in ortho uh, in, in position for the two uh, image data sets. So we can see that, yes, our buildings are well aligned. Um, I'm also pointing to some, some things that we'll, um, that we'll see from time to time in our data, which are our holes. Those would typically get corrected uh, after uh, after the fact, uh, but for for those data set that I'm highlighting, there was no manual correction done. And now I'm just again panning around a little bit, um, looking at the different features, and I'm going to focus on this area here, which um, kind of uh, we we thought was quite interesting when we first saw it. Uh, again, I'm just turning on and off uh, vegetation, but what I'd like you to focus on is uh, we've extracted only one building and we have multiple uh, features here that, that will kind of look like buildings, which I'm surprised the algorithm didn't pick up. I'm just turning on the, the imagery now, the, the base imagery that was used for the extraction, and we can see those are actually trailers, which were not identified by, by our algorithm as, uh, as building. Uh, which was a, uh, an issue in the past, but now uh, we've trained the, the model enough so that it can make the distinction between building and trailers. So from our perspective, GOI has immense potential, not only as a means to accelerate foundational geospatial data creation, maintenance and revision, but also to open up uh, a wealth of possibility for change detection capacity uh, due to the temporality in the data. As such, it can be used to assess an area before, during, and after an emergency and disastrous events. Uh, the, the animation here shown on the right is an example of the GOAI change detection in action. 
The first image shows the neighborhood in Fort McMurray in Alberta in, in 2014. The green lines show the location of buildings as extracted by, by our, our, our approaches. And then the second image shows the same year in 2016 after the community was impacted by a wildfire. This example shows the potential of that, to evaluate the degree and extent of changes resulting from, from such disastrous events. Another use case for GOAI is to document and inform on climate change science and adaptation. GOAI enables us to look uh, to unlock the potential value of the National Air Photo Library, which is a collection of historical air photo that we have access to here at NRCAN. For example, here uh, it allows us to monitor geophysical trends over time, as shown as the, by that, the animation seen on the right here. We can see the retreat of the bank over almost 60 years at the Tuktoyaktuk in Northwest Territories. Uh, we can also use GOAI to provide up-to-date geospatial information to northern remote communities uh, quickly and efficiently. GOAI can also be used, uh, as we show on here on this slide, to track changes in monitor forested areas, notably to evaluate changes in forest cover. Uh, in combination with other tools, namely the leaf area index comparator tool that we that we have that we um, uh, that we use uh, by our data cube platform we can pinpoint dynamic areas and drill down using goai to map out changes at a local scale as highlighted by the image on the right we even were successful in developing approaches capable of counting individual trees in, in an urban context uh, but for the moment that remains uh, a, a uh, some preliminary work or uh, pilot projects Use for GOAI is to follow changes in urban growth, as shown on the, the left image for Quebec City. This type of modeling can be used to better understand the development of urban areas to make informed decisions on infrastructure planning and in emergency preparedness. There are other potential uses for GOAI, especially when considering um, building features, as they can be used as a base for, for things like energy consumption and, and energy potential. Uh, we understand, though, that by themselves, the geometries are rather incomplete to provide very precise estimates on a per building level. Uh, but when averaged out over the scale of a city, then they become very, very valuable data sets. Now, as mentioned, um, the, the GOAI, the, the first sample data sets for GOAI are publicly available. Here I show a quick example of how to access it. Uh, it's a, only a Google search away. If you search for GOAI GeoBase series, um, you'll, um, you can select the first entry. And as part of that, we have a few uh, few ways to access the data. But here I'm showing it through the data index. So we have a web service that lists all of the um, all the areas where we have extractions available for, um, for for and that have been shared publicly, as well as our backlog of uh, data set that should be available soon. Um, here I'm just uh, going through the application, zooming in a little bit on an area that I want to focus on. I'll actually turn on the um, the, the pop-ups for um, for this so that I get uh, some download links. Uh, so here you see we have the, the, the published that are published data sets that are uh, shown in green. Now I'll just click on one, and then there you have a couple of links. I'll click on the geopackaged one, and you saw um, the, the the file downloaded. So this is the um, one way that we currently have to to access the data. Um, I'll also note that we have a uh, web page on geo.ca that, that gives a little bit more context to the data series. So upcoming improvement edition. Um, mainly those will be on two fronts. The first one is going to be on modeling and processing. Uh, so we're actively working to improve our auto-rectification process of, uh, for, for satellite imagery uh, using a combination of, uh, of, high uh, of our high-resolution digital elevation model uh, as well as automatically extract the buildings. Uh, we're also working on, on integrating new source type plus doing data fusion as part of our GOAI processes. Um, on the, the second, um, second stream of activities that we're, um, 
and improvements that we're looking to make is on the dissemination and product side. Uh, we want to focus on extracting more classes, but we also want to focus on providing web services such as uh, WMS Temporal so that the, to, to enable easy visualization um, of the, the features, especially uh, as they are time enabled. And we are also looking into providing mosaic data sets or so combining um, features from various extraction, providing a sort of best of representation um, at a high resolution for foundational geospatial information in Canada. All of this was not done in silo. We've had many partnerships to help us along in research activities with key actors such as uh, the Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, University of Sherbrooke, University of Winnipeg, La Creme, and the MILA. We've also worked with federal, provincial, and territorial partners through the Canadian Council on Geomatics and the Geobase Steering Committee. Uh, as chair of the committee, we strive to abide by the geobase principle of um, build once, use many times, and to provide data without restriction under an open data license. I'd also like to thank a few early partners from the Government of Quebec, New Brunswick, and Newfoundland and Labrador. They graciously provided data, which was key for model development, training, and early production. Of course, we're, we're looking to develop similar projects with all other provinces and territories in the near future. So thanks again for listening in on my presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've listed a few useful links. The best way to get in touch is uh, to email me. Address is listed here. If you want to access the data or learn more about the data, you can do so through geo.ca. Uh, finally, if you're interested in exploring our tool set, you can go to our GitHub repo where you'll find the same set of tools that we use in our pipeline. And with that, I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks and have a good day and a good rest of the conference.